Oh, kia ora koutou. I just want to begin by acknowledging um, uh, Naitahu Fanu, the mana whenua of this place. Uh, I want to acknowledge this building that we're in. Good to see you standing strong um, and thank everyone here for coming out on a cool winter's night. Um, I've uh, got a few, what, seven trips and t t tricks and tips for containing community. Um, this is a talk uh, that was originally called Igniting Community. And I thought to myself, I don't know if communities want to be ignited. Um, I don't know if they want to be contained either, but I thought that this kind of, this uh, name cuts to the um, chase for me in this challenge of uh, working in or organic and emergent and non-hierarchical ways. I think the word containment is often felt as a negative, as a constraint. You know, we want to contain the outbreak. We want to contain the problem. But the reason I've called this talk um, containing community is I think that without a strong container, it's very hard to get anywhere. So if you think about a boat or a, a car or a vessel or a vehicle, um, I think those things are needed. And uh, these are the seven ideas for how to give some form and structure um, and direction um, to our projects. The first, uh, this is really comes from an asset-based community development way of thinking, and so these are really seven assets, and these are fairly obvious, but hopefully there's some nuance in here that's useful or interesting. Identity is an asset. Um, any group of people, I think, uh, will have a look and a feel, and if we can articulate that and amplify it, um, then I think we make that group uh, stronger and, um, and more uh, enabled. But I also think particularly genealogy and lineage, often we think of identity as something that's going to carry us forward. But if I've learned anything from my um, interactions with the Māori world, it's, it's that the past is really um, the, the thing that gives us momentum and gives us guidance and helps us navigate the future. Membership is an asset. Um, I work with lots of groups and communities and they don't know who their community is. They have a general idea. Um, but the idea of actually having a list um, of names, um, everyone, a lot of groups have databases, but um, I think those are often very out of date and there's not a lot of uh, information in there about who's a core member or who's more peripheral. Um, so anything that can help cl provide clarity about what's in and what's out, I think is useful. And particularly in the transition, um, it's often easy to join things, it's hard to leave things, it's hard to leave things cleanly. So if there's a process for helping people know that they maybe they're done with that, with that group for now, and a, and a, a process um, of helping them exit with dignity and, um, and for the group to be clear about who's no longer around. Form, form is an asset. I think any legal organisation has the benefit of having an org chart, having um, some clarity about who the employees are, who the management is. So if we want to move away from that um, and experience and experiment with, uh, without those formal structures, we almost need to pay extra attention to the shape, um, not less. So if it's not an org chart or legal structure, what is it? You know, what are the, the ceremonies and rituals or other practices we can use to define the boundaries. And particularly the type and frequency of the encounter. So in a traditional organization, we'd have meetings or AGMs. But again, if we're not going to do that, um, what are the ways that we bring people together? Um, what's the rhythm, particularly the heartbeat, um, the cadence that provides that group with clarity? Knowledge is an asset, um, but not just intellectual property, not just what we know. I think um, once we move out of the, the traditional conventional organization, uh, we get into some murkier territory about how do we know things or what do we do with the things that we know. Um, so I think that this is some of the challenge of working um, outside the box is needing to actually think quite a lot harder um, about the things we, we believe in. Um, learning is an asset. The idea of a learning organisation is not new. For me, that goes back to Peter Singe's fifth discipline, 1998, I think it was. Um, but I think, again, while um, this is important for any organisation, 
It's particularly key when we uh, are working in community and the currency perhaps is non-financial um, and we need other currencies um, with which to um, support our interactions. And I think knowledge and learning and the ability to grow, um, why would I be part of something that didn't have extrinsic rewards or well, probably intrinsic rewards? So what are they um, and how can we support those? Um, and I wouldn't be afraid to write it down and codify it. I think textbooks and curriculums and all of those things are, are, really, uh, are really useful. Uh, similarly with purpose. Um, often purpose is an immediate sort of short-term thing. Um, but, but I'd love to see more groups publishing manifestos and describing ex uh, in precise terms what it is that they're a stand for, um, what winning looks like to them. Um, and if it's not, again, that explicit space, then I think it's the harder questions, the, the tacit, um, the water we swim in, um, that's the thing that uh, really drives the group forward. And finally, I think a lot of this stuff comes down to um, shifting from a transactional paradigm into a relational paradigm. Um, and it's not just traditional things like allies and sponsors and partners but I think it's the, um, the, the deeply traditional practices of um, the place we're in, the historical moment we're in, the stories we tell, what our sacred cows are, um, and the food that we share with each other. So those are just seven <coughs> ways that I think about building uh, community and building networks in a non hierarchical and non-centralized manner. Thank you for your attention and we'll pick up that, some questions at the end. <laughs>